Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where my awesome co host, epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens, and I speak with people from all walks of the publishing industry. Lurking for Legends is a live interactive broadcast, and we encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests or simply make comments on what you hear in the show. So, tonight we have David Ellis, known across platforms by his handle too full to write if you're looking for him um, he's a writer he's a podcaster lyricist humorist novelist an author and a poet not to mention the co-founder of auroras and blossom so there's a lot to talk about there welcome david how are you i'm very well thank you and thank you both for having me on the show today you're welcome. Absolutely. It's such an honor to have you and a real pleasure. I've I've had the pleasure of talking to you before and really it's so easy to go on and on. So we're going to have to control ourselves here. <laughs> so tell us uh, a little bit about yourself just to start with. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I used to work in the financial services uh, industry. Uh, I clocked up about 17 years uh, there, but I never lost, lost my passion uh, for the English language and uh, literature itself as well. It's the only thing that I really excelled at at school. You know, I was kind of average in most other sort of subjects, but really, really good at English language. It's something that I've always harbored a sort of passion for. And it's only really, I'd say, within the last uh, few years, I say going back to 2016, um, that I actually started to seriously take uh, take my kind of uh, writing career a bit more seriously than I had done years ago. I, I, I kind of wrote sort of lots of spoof lyrics. Um, and um, I kind of uh, I made I made a couple of music albums, and they were never released commercially. Um, but I, I, you know, that they had kind of sort of a com comedy undertones. Um, and in 2016, uh, I joined a, a local writers circle, and they encouraged me and said, "Let's start a blog, um, and do something with uh, with your blog." And I'd had no idea what I was going to do. And I, because I, I was writing all these uh, song lyrics, I thought, "Why don't I try writing poetry?" Because uh, I wasn't writing many sort of hooks for the songs, and also I was writing lots of long verses, and they didn't really fit sort of song structures. And from there, that's when I feel my birth as, as a poet began. It was kind of like uh, in gestation for many years um, while I was uh, working in financial services, getting bored out of my mind, and I'd be writing lots and lots and lots of lyrics uh, to, to kind of while the time. I'd be writing things every day, sometimes two or three a day. Um, I always had that mantra like, uh, with Bob Dylan. I think we, I think he said something like, write not 10 songs a day and throw nine away. Uh, but I kept everything that I did. I had about 200 um, in the, um, you know, the, the, the song lyrics in, in the end. And a lot of them were, uh, funnily enough, um, they were quite negative at the time because I was upset with the bit working in the financial industry. And then when I started becoming a poet in 2016, um, and, um, you know, really kind of seriously looking at my poetry and trying to ape my sort of peers, I ended up uh, becoming a very positive person. So I kind of flipped everything on its head there and became a very positive poet in relation to inspiration, uh, romance, uh, philosophy and comedy and that, that kind of stuff. I wanted to entertain people. And um, so that's what I ended up doing. I ended up writing three books in 2016. Um, and then I kind of had a lull uh, with that. Um, and then then it, things picked up again in, in 2019. Uh, when I formed Auroras and Blossoms uh, with my uh, co-founder, uh, Sandrine Marois. And uh, once I formed that platform, it's an inspirational art platform. So uh, I'm sure you want to talk to me about that as well. So, Yeah, definitely. And she's in the chat right now. Thank you so much for coming. So definitely, yeah, we'll just start with that. And I know that we're, we're not going to spend all our time on that because I believe right. we will be interviewing both of you together um, at another point. So we'll talk about it more most in depth then. But yeah, definitely tell us a little bit about what Auroras and Blossoms is. And uh, of course, that's someplace people can submit. So they should definitely check out the website. I'll go get it. I, they, they definitely should do. I mean, um, ultimately, uh, I don't want to to steal the thunder of uh, the upcoming interview uh, with with the two of us and with Sandrine herself as well. Um, but just to give you a brief sort of cliff notes, uh, Sandrine and I were kind of like on each other's radar. Uh, we uh, interviewed each other on our respective blogs, and we talked about how there was a lack of uh, positivity in terms of uh, what the poetry we were seeing, the poetry that's been submitted to other journals that were out there. And we said, why don't we form a poetry journal, a positive poetry journal? And we ended up doing that we put a lot of work in we spent months tweaking the website and getting it all ready and we launched uh, the Auroras and Blossoms Poetry Journal in 2019 uh, we then uh, launched a creative arts journal because we didn't want to restrict ourselves to just poetry and then from there we were like uh, well, why don't we try and merge the two and we did that and then we did a lot of other things like workbooks and journals we started uh, an artistic movement called Poe Art Mo. Uh, there was a collective that Sandrine was with, but she merged that into, uh, and it's now the Poe Art Mo Collective. So we've got that as well. We've got so we've got art projects with other kind of artists and writers. 
Um, we deal with photographers, uh, illustrators, um, um, short story people, flash fiction people, um, a a along with alongside poetry people as well. So we've really kind of expanded our platform, um, but we have shut down the poetry uh, side, uh, poetry journal side uh, for, for now uh, because people weren't happy paying um, uh, submission fees. Uh, we charged a very low submission fee, um, but we had to actually close it down uh, this uh, this year uh, because uh, people just weren't uh, submitting to us uh, anymore because uh, and uh, we were having a lot of trouble with people that were being rude and weren't uh, <laughs> following our instructions. You know, a lot of people uh, would improve their chances of being published in a magazine if they read the instructions properly and if they weren't so blase about how they just chuck things at people if they didn't try and just blast it to someone's email address or actually, you know, you, you should really kind of see if it's, it's relevant for the, for the publication you're sending it to. Um, but yeah, so so we we kind of shifted gears, and our focus now is anthologies, uh, workbooks and journals, the artistic movement, and we've created our own poetry forms uh, and and a written form as well. So we've got several forms that we've created as well, and we have our, the artistic projects. We've just got so much, and I w I think I went from the three publications that I told you about in 2016 to when I got involved with Sandrine and the Rose and Blossoms in 2019. I've gone up to now nearly 30 publications that we've been involved with so far. That's amazing. 30. How? How do you do it? <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> well, I've got eight books myself now, so I feel like the Auroras and Blossoms magic rubbed off on me as well. I've actually slowed down when it comes to publication of my own books. But uh, yeah, and you're holding one of them up there right now. <laughs> nice. Now, I see that uh, I was going through your website and I saw you know all the different books that you write and there, there's quite a cross-section of books that you do write from inspirational to positive to beliefs and then i came across one that really stood out to me it i think i know which one you're going to say but it's going to make me laugh i think yeah 50 shapes of cake <laughs> yeah i knew you were going to say that because that's the one that kind of sticks out like a sore thumb with it it says that you, you probably won't be the same after you've done reading this book and what it Initial thing that went through my mind was that, uh, you know, as authors, we get a, a bunch of readers behind us that like our stuff and they keep reading our stuff because they like it. So have you ever had readers that, you know, they love your Shakespeare, uh, your inspirational Shakespeare poetry and your inspiration, uh, the other books that you write and all of a sudden come across 50 Shapes of Cake and send you some kind of comment saying, you know, this is not what I expected. <laughs> They say, uh, you know, this this sounds too rude and too. Uh, you you seem, seem so, so nice, you know. And why are you doing something like that? But I think that I mean, I probably should have uh, gone with the author mantra of uh, looking, uh, setting up a separate pen name uh, for for that, simply because when when um, when it's kind of sort of brought into the kind of sort of portfolio of stuff that I've done. There has been a couple of instances where people have said you're family friendly. So what are you doing with this filth? And to what to, to wit to what I say is well, it's not filthy because actually, if they actually read the book, they would realise that um, I've actually turned into. If you can imagine um, the kind of um, erotica and uh, sex books and stuff like that. I've kind of made a PG uh, erotica kind of book because every time the innuendo kind of sort of spot comes up, um, I mean, it started out in life as I, I saw a lot of people doing tweets um, and there was 50 shades of grey. And I come up with a concept and say, well, what if I did it about cakes? Because cakes are very funny. Uh, um, well, cakes, are fu cakes make you hungry, <laughs> but also um, the uh, analogy with cakes is that they can be very kind of sort of, you see the, the chefs, the TV chefs like Nigella Lawson, Jamie Oliver, Gordon Ramsay, and they talk about things in, in dirty sort of ways, but they do it with a lot of innuendo. And I just thought, oh, I could do that with cakes and, uh, or, or, and, and cake products. So that's what I tried to, to do it. It was kind of sort of people mistook me. They thought I was a baker. They actually interviewed me for uh, a, uh, a newspaper and they went and said, oh, baking um, aficionado David Ellis. And I'm kind of like, uh, they said, do you bake, David? And I said, well, no. And then they were, weren't interested in the story anymore because they thought oh, I, should, I, I was a baker. Um, but <laughs> so I ended up, it, it started off as tweets and then I then made it a, into a book collection um, but it's very much kind of like, I don't know if you're aware of the carry on films, the kind of wink, wink, yeah. nudge, nudge, say yeah. no more. And that's where it kind of sort of stemmed from is that there were silly little things like I, I would think about anything to do with, um, you know, erotic, uh, erotic. I, I would take I would steal things from erotica and I would start the sentence off 
and you would just be thinking, oh, this is a get a bit steamy, and you start pulling your collar back and thinking, oh, this is going to be juicy. And then the punchline would come up, and then you'd just be like, what? I don't understand what just happened there. Um, and I would draw lots of different influences. Like one of the things I can remember from the top of my head was that when 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 they make that joke about it, saying, you know what they say about uh, men with big feet. And then wink, wink, kind of sort of thing. And then they're waiting for the punchline. And then it said, and then I said, it, um, they can get to the bakery quicker. And so it's <laughs> just there was like lots of kind of sort of so there was puns, but there was lots of things about like doing things with cakes and bread, like and, and how you make them and how sensual it was. And then um, you know, I think one of the ones that I, um, I use in my um, kind of advert for it, I've got a trailer uh, for it, was about how. Um, someone is relentlessly having their head banged against the headboard. And then it's, it's at that point he realised he should have bought his wife uh, custard donuts instead of jam ones. And it's <laughs> so every time I keep taking something like that, and um, I had an American reader read it, and she just said some of the things went over her head because she said it seems very British, and there's a lot yeah. of British humour in it. And I was just like, well, there is, but at the same time, I feel like it's still very uh, universal in, in the themes and stuff there. And, you know, when, when I did it, I just thought, I have to list it in kind of like the erotica um, kind of categories, but I'm like, but there's no real erotica in it, there's comedy. Um, so I was hoping that that would actually help boost it as well, because I'm kind of taking an affectionate poke or stab at the erotica genre. Um, but I've also created the first what I call PG erotica uh, comedy kind of sort of book. And um, that's what that's why I find when I when I was first also when I was writing about it, I know someone local to me uh, actually went and said on a tweet, oh, you know, 50 shapes of cakes. That's disgusting what, what he's doing or whatever. <laughs> and I just I remember having a conversation with my uncle and saying, well, Good. I'm glad it's making her angry because I'm going to do it even more now. Um, so I'm, I'm that kind of sort of person. Is that if someone tells me not to do something, but uh, for the wrong reasons, then I, then I'll okay. Well, I'm going to keep doing it <laughs> even harder now. So no, yeah, I think it's brilliant. That's why I brought it up because uh, you know, and I think it's great that you did not use a pen name. That you know, this is you. This is David Ellison. If the people uh, want to get to know you know their favorite author, then they want to know all about David. They don't want you to be fake or false or whatever. I know people use pen names for different things to sell different genres and stuff like that. But I, I think it's brilliant that you just kept your name there and people see that. And, you know, if anyone knows Brit, the Brits, they know they have that uh, little bit of a bizarre sense of humor and that, you know, just take it with a grain of salt and enjoy the book for what it is. So, no, that's oh, awesome. I, I thought it was, it was so cute. When I was looking through, I see all these inspirational books and Shakespeare and all that, you know, deep stuff and then 50 shapes of cake you know Ooh, what's that? <laughs> well that's what i'd like to try and that's why i did it because i wanted to kind of sort of show how resourceful i can be when it comes to oh, you did uh, that. different that's things great. and uh, and how broad my scope can kind of be because i know a lot of people focus on on things um but i kind of feel like i like to keep the talent unfolding and trying different things and um, it is. It can be jarring because people will kind of come for the poetry and just one person went and said, uh, actually reviewed it as, and they went and said, this poetry is uh, awful or wrong or something. And I was like, it's it's not poetry. <laughs> it's basically the reason they're so short, but then because Twitter made me a great editor as well of my own work, especially when it comes to poetry and things, because you had to uh, restrict it to the character limit. So I'd had to be very kind of sort of judicious with the use of commas and 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 how I phrase things and grammar and things. And I didn't want everything to be the same way because a lot of the tweets were just conversations between two people. Um, and so it's characters and dialogue. So it's a dialogue between a couple of people. And, and some of them actually were Anastasia and Christian Gray. Uh, so I'd have Anna or Christian, um, but I wouldn't mention their full names. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, then I kind of like, so I did actually use the first uh, 50 um, Shades of Grey book as inspiration uh, for it. Um, I think I started reading the second one, but then people lost interest and I, I've not really been able to to push it. I feel like it's one of those things where the market's saturated. Now you've had the movies now as well. And I still think it's very, very funny as, as, as a concept. And I'd love to do more of it. And I think I might do it in the future when things are still sort of calmed down because it, to me, it still seems fresh and uh, and funny. But there's only so many different cakes and biscuit types you can take the mickey out of. And <laughs> so eventually you start to run out of inspiration. That's great. And that Christy didn't. We have some, uh, We've got a lot of comments just, just keep coming in. I, I think Christy had a hard time keeping up with them, but uh, go ahead, Christy. <laughs> yeah, let's. Uh, well, we have some really funny stuff here because of the erotica <laughs> type of theme <laughs> that's really cracking me up. And I, I asked Rebecca Jonesy, who has written um, that kind of genre, before I asked her, you said PG erotica. And I said, is that allowed? 
And she says that she gives it the Josie stamp of approval and <laughs> encouragement. And she says, dirty clean, I call it. <laughs> dirty clean. Yeah, this, this is the thing. You know, it's just, um, I mean, if I gave one one example, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know. I said something about someone, and I don't know whether I can say this. I mean, am I allowed to? Uh, it's not swearing. Um, but I mentioned about somebody having uh, screaming out saying they had blue balls. And I said, when I specifically asked for hundreds and thousands. Now, hundreds and thousands are some kind of uh, sprinkle uh, kind of sort of thing you put on cupcakes. But I then went and found some royalty free pictures in uh, um, in the, like Pixabay and stuff. And I found a gingerbread man where, and he was decorated with blue balls. And I just thought that's funny because I've taken oh the, the, er the erotica kind of sort of thing, which is the naughty side. And then I then turned it on its head. And that's the kind of sort of thing that I was doing. And, you know, it's this is it's kind of liberating to be able to sort of say something like this because I thought, I oh, know, I'm going to be sensitive. But you see, so I've, I've spoken about it, but it's kind of. You know, it's it's almost um, kind of taking uh, you know the innuendo that the kind of erotic genre itself and just completely flipping it on its head. And I keep saying to myself, I wish I could come up with a concept as good as that <laughs> again because I feel like it's bottle in, uh, lightning in a bottle, and I really would love to do that again. So. <laughs> It's a lot. Of, it sounds like a lot of fun. I think everybody in the comments is having a lot of fun. Margaret is saying, I mean, Ladyfingers writes its own jokes, you know. <laughs> exactly. Some of the things are so naughty, like pound cake. It's just like, oh, OK. <laughs> and so on and so on. It's just like, yeah, yeah. It's just it is. It's just, This is how it lends it. Because also um, a lot of people, a lot of women came to me and sort of saying like uh, they thought uh, that, um, the whole thing was elegant. You know, they say cakes are elegant and cooking is elegant and stuff. As well. And I like that sort of sensual side as well. Um, but then some people were saying to me, is this a recipe book? And I said, no, I don't know any recipes. Uh, <laughs> it's just a humor book. And they didn't like what I'd done to, to cake. So we, we get some people that love the idea and especially bakers. I, I got a couple of compliments from bakers. And I just thought that's so sweet because it's like they uh, were kind of like they, they, they thought it was hilarious. And I just thought good because that was the kind of sort of not, not who I was pitching it to. But I thought if they, they like it, then I've managed to trick people into thinking, as I said, you know, that I thought I was a, a baker. <laughs> <laughs> that's my guess my chameleonic kind of sort of uh, way of dealing with things is that I kind of get so deep into my kind of sort of uh, character and research and stuff and, and I can fool people into thinking that I'm actually competent at sort of something when <laughs> when when I'm not when I'm just a trickster when I'm just a trickster I'm a bit sort of like low key or something <laughs> <laughs> well, we have uh, we have a number of questions for you actually in the comments, and uh, before we get into that, I do want to read um, David Kelly's comment, which is referring back to something you said earlier. Um, Asimov was once contacted by a reader complaining that his history of the Bible was just that a history of the Bible and not sci-fi. So that kind of goes along with what you're saying about you yeah, know exactly. people not Thank quite grasping the concept even when you tell them just exactly, what it is yeah. exactly in plain English. Well, I try to uh, put great. a kind of sort of plain we message in a lot of my poetry mm -hmm. and stuff. I try to um, make things very sort of straightforward and have a clear message, but then that takes away some of the mystery and drama and things. So sometimes I do try to leave things a little bit abstract or ambiguous. Um, but what, sometimes when I do that, I don't know if I leave it too abstract or ambiguous. I don't know if people are left high and dry. Um, so I like to have some kind of thing, some kind of emotional core to grab people. Um, it's, it doesn't something doesn't have to necessarily make absolute sense or it can be kind of like a, a bit kind of like off the off the shelf or off the cuff um, but at the same time if it's got some kind of I like to have something to have either either be cathartic or have some kind of powerful punchy message underlying message in it yeah and that it, it's such a truth about poetry that you know especially with limited words and depending on your form you know of course like you're saying it's it's very easy to have yeah, Mandy is saying super concept. It's so easy to um, write something that you understand, but then maybe other people won't quite get and trying to make sure it's like, you know, they'll get it, but at the same time, leaving it, you know, maybe metaphorical or for their interpretation that can get you hits and stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. It's very tricky sometimes to determine what you want to do exactly to still have it be yours, you know, <laughs> but also and I try not to hang on to things too uh, hard as well. Like uh, I'm very used to, uh, kind of um, okay. I've written this. I'm going to edit it to the best of my ability, and I can I can be satisfied with something. Some things might take me a little longer than I want them to, but I can pump out poems, say in an hour or two, uh, or quicker. Sometimes it all depends on the inspiration. But sometimes it might take four, five, six hours or something. But I'll usually keep working on something until I'm happy with it. Um, but I won't do the thing where you kind of put things in a drawer. I do that with uh, I would do that with short stories and things. But I feel like because uh, when you're writing poetry or flash fiction or something like that, it's, it's such a short, uh, small, small kind of sort of piece. I can ed usually edit that sort of stuff very, very quickly because it, there's only a certain number of ways you can kind of interpret or do something. 
And I've shortened my poetry a lot. I used to write 30 lines every single time. And I would do Napo Rimo, National Poetry Writing Month, and I would make myself ill at the end of the month because I'd do 30 lines every day. And I'd just be like, surely there's got to be a better way. And then I then learned I could write shorter po poetry and shorter poems a lot quicker. And now most of my poems are only 10, 15 lines, sometimes shorter than that a lot of the time, mm -hmm. especially when I'm doing found poetry as well. So. You mentioned Napo Rimo, and I had never heard of that before. I'm not a poet. But... Uh, it makes sense that we have an apple rhymo as well. And, and I was looking on your website, and last year you wrote a poem for every day in the month of November. And are those the 30 line poems that you wrote? Uh, no, they're um, found poetry. It's found poetry. So, um, around about a couple of years ago, I started uh, almost exclusively dealing in found poetry. Um, but before then, I was, I was doing. Uh, well, well, before I was writing freeform poetry where I could write any number of lines in the poem. Uh, I wasn't following any particular uh, style or, or form. I have done uh, forms in the past. Uh, they're, they're good exercises. It's fun sometimes if I want. They don't give me inspiration in terms of I have to combine them with some other kind of theme. If I say I'm going to write a uh, Villanelle poem, for example, um, just because I, uh, I say I'm going to write a Villanelle poem doesn't give me the inspiration to write one. I have to say I'm going to write it about cakes. So I'll write it about cakes, and then I have to combine the elements um, but uh, yeah, I mean, with my poetry, um, I, I discovered, uh, I kind of discovered what I, I like to think of as the Holy Grail. Um, and it caused me to go and buy tons and tons and tons of poetry books from charity shops, you know, thrift stores and stuff like that. Uh, and they're all sitting on my shelf because basically I'm going to go through every single one and I'm going to steal <laughs> so much inspiration. Um, I say steal. I mean, basically, I'm going to take inspiration, not steal, uh, from uh, all these people, all these wonderful people. So found poetry is where you take a uh, piece of written text. You usually take one page. So it works well with poetry if you've got one page of poetry, although I have done a found poem based on one of Walt Whitman's poems and since he's had hundreds of uh, pages on that uh, the, po the poem that I made had about 100 lines in the end it was quite an epic uh, kind of one that I wrote but usually um, found poetry means that you're pinching words from a, a, a text you're kind of like picking out the words that you like and you create you're drawing them out of that and you're creating something new and you can do it with almost any piece of written uh, text you could do it with the um, with a TV guide uh, although it, the thing is, uh, if you use something that isn't quite sort of literary, that's why I like to use books. So I like to use a page from a book or a page from uh, poetry, because if you do a bit of nonfiction uh, work or, or, or a TV guide or something like that, it's going to have a lot of dry language. You're going to want to have something that's got colourful language in there. You're not going to want to pinch the stuff. Like if you went and grabbed a Harry Potter book, for example, you're, you're not going to put a poem in there and start mentioning. You can mention Harry, but you can't say Potter, obviously, uh, but, and maybe even Hermione but, uh, um, you know, and some of the other characters. But the problem is, is you shouldn't be using anything that's copyrighted in terms of character names or anything like that. But what you can do is go through a piece and just go, oh, I like them, them words. And then from there, you try and build, and the way I try to do it is I try to write something completely different. Some people, you know, they talk about, when you talk about plagiarism, you can say you can normally get away with stealing one line, but if you take a second line, and you don't want the line to be easily identifiable as well, because if you steal something that you know is very unique to someone, some kind of one line or quip or something from a famous book or novel, you're going to get found out, you know, it's plagiarism. But what I like to do is take a, a particular piece of text or a poem and try to write a completely different poem based around that. And I can give you an example, like uh, I, I wrote, uh, I think, How to Be a Writer, I think, uh, by Chuck, um, uh, Charles Bukowski. And um, I, th I think it's called How to Be a Writer. And his is quite negative all the way through. And it says, don't do this, don't do that. And I just went through it and I just went, OK, I'll turn it into a positive poem by just taking out all the don'ts. <laughs> and I re and so I came up with a brand new original poem. Um, so sometimes you can take kind of sort of negative uh, poem or poetry or negative words from sort of somewhere or, or a negative kind of sort of piece and turn that into a positive. You know, that's my, always been my philosophy about saying, can you turn a negative into positive or something inspirational? And uh, found poetry is just the is the process, and I do it in a very specific way. So some people might jiggle the words around, uh, and then it doesn't become necessarily called found poetry. I, I do it in a way it's called blackout poetry, where I use the words where I find them, and then I then go through that way. And what happens is is that sometimes it forces me to use very specific grammar or techniques. 
Um, and also it forces me to use words. I have to end things in a certain way. And it means that I write things in a certain way that I wouldn't normally write myself. And that's what's so fun and fascinating about it and what's endlessly, endlessly inspirational and makes me think that I'm going to have infinite inspiration. Now, I'm not going to have enough time in my life to write all the books of poetry <laughs> that I want to do because I can literally draw inspiration from any book. And it's not just when I say any book, is that you think about any book has two or 300 pages. So I could flick to any page in any book and I could say, right, I can probably write something based on that. It, it might be that I can't immediately do that, but I've generally found that the harder it is, the better the piece that comes out. You know, I, I might better get something out of that. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your comment, uh, Mandy. <laughs> um, it is incredibly intriguing because you can literally just take anything. Um, and that's why I like to, you know, I've always said I like to use, if, if I take an inspirational poem by Mary Oliver, uh, chances are I'm going to write an inspirational poem. It's going to be very flowery language and, and very kind of happy myself. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see what happens when you take something that isn't positive and either you make something positive out of it because then you can definitely say, oh, people can't see what you've uh, stolen <laughs> from someone else. Um, but then if you take someone like uh, Edgar Allan Poe, which I wrote a book of uh, poems about, or um, the Shakespeare, sometimes they take on a little bit of the flavour, um, but then I write them in my own kind of sort of way. So the language might come across as a bit of sort of ye oldy worldy sort of things, but I try not to... Um, do that much because I don't want someone to have to uh, think, oh, they've got to try and you know understand that I'm trying to make the message still clear. But I will be saying things where the, the grammar and the kind of the way it's kind of sort of structured and the way it's framed don't come out the way I would normally write something. I'd write, normally write something when I'm doing free form, something very clear, positive. I might I might go on different tangents. I might do some comedy. I might do uh, some romantic kind of sort of poetry. Um, but with found poetry, the, the, fas the fascination for me is kind of like, what will you get out of it? And I tell you, I, some, I go into it and I get things out of it. And then I share with people, I'm in a group called the New Romantics. It's NU and then Romantics. And uh, there's a private group, uh, but they've got their own kind of page as well. And they do a lot of uh, romantic, saucy and naughty kind of sort of poetry and stuff. And I write a lot of inspirational stuff for that group. I've even done prompts for them as well. And you kind of get their prompts and you just don't know what you're going to get out of it. And a lot of the time I'll pair it with a, with a nice graphic and people will be like, wow, that's amazing. I'd just be like, well, that's just what I what I see. So it's kind of it's maybe it's reading between the lines. Maybe that's just what I see when I when I write. And and that's what I, I do now. Basically, I mean, I'm addicted to it so much. And as you, as you say, uh, Richard, um, I've, I, I did Napo Rimo for, for five uh, years. I didn't do uh, this this year because of. Uh, just with the pandemic and I just felt too tired to do it because I'm very busy with Auroras and Blossoms. Uh, so I thought I'd take a break this year and also they never feature me. So I'm not bitter or anything, but, <laughs> um, but basically, um, you know, I've been doing it for a few, few years and I've been doing the free form thing and I've been following their prompts and things. And some of the things that I found is that when they gave a prompt, they'd be like, do a Villanelle poem. And I'd be like, well, okay, but that's not enough for me. But sometimes they would say, do something about snow. And you just go, okay, let's have a look at all the classical poems that have been written about snow. Then I could then pick someone and I'd pick and say, OK, Emily Dickinson has done one about snow uh, years ago. Her poems are very short, by the way. So you'd have to try and write haikus uh, out of them. You could still do you could maybe do a found haiku because you, she hasn't got a lot of words to draw. And I'd like to try and find people that have got at least a few words to draw on. But I've got so many people that I've written poems uh, based around as Maya Angelou and Emily Dickinson and uh, Sylvia Plath and, uh, you know, t uh, Jane Austen and absolutely you know tons and tons of con and, and some contemporary poets as well so but yeah haik haikus are very very good i just saw anita's comment there about uh, haikus mm. they are very very good to, <laughs> if you want to write sort of something short and um but then we created a, a, a found poetry style uh, myself and sandrine uh based around uh, it was a combination of found poetry and uh and the haiku nature you know we end up calling it the kind coup um and um and what we do with that is that we take seven words from, from, from a piece of writing. So you could go back to something like an Emily Dickinson poem and say, I could actually find seven words here because I can't actually get a poem out of here because it's just too small. You know, her, her, her verse is too short, but we could write kind cues about the thing. So I then found that I had another facet of all this found poetry that I was writing saying, oh my God, I can write endless <laughs> kind cues for the shorter poems I got now. So whereas that I had to discard some of the very, very short poems that people have written, I was like, now I can do something with that as well. So I've really got all the inspiration that I could find. I'd have to be like James Patterson and I have to teach people my technique and then they say, right, we're going to write them under the umbrella of David Ellis and then and then, and then I'll put out 200 books a year or something. <laughs> that doesn't sound too bad, actually. <laughs> J.D. Estrada is asking, any spoken word plans? That is an interesting one. 
Well, I tried to uh, start to record my debut, um, my debut uh, poetry collection, uh, Life, Sex and Death, which funnily enough, you know, so it's got the word sex in it and that kind of put some people off. And I said, it's romantic. There's no talk about uh, there's no dirty words. There's no actual sex in there. Uh, so I, I kind of say to myself, I wish I hadn't called it that. But I said, well, that's it's my name, LSD, you know, David Ellis, LSD, L, S and D, Life, Sex and Death. Um, and because I wrote some music years ago under MC LSD, <laughs> uh, so I just thought I'm going to do something with that and uh, with the LSD, and that's why I did the Life, Sex, and Death. But I started trying to read some of the stuff that I wrote in that, and I kind of was a bit of a masochist when it comes to myself in terms of um, I didn't really leave a kind of clear, easy pathway for me to be able to read sort of stuff in the future. I made lots of tongue twisters, and I found that with my second uh, book, which I think you mentioned, the Soul Music book as well, is that um, I would say probably my first two or three books of freeform poetry, there are some real tongue twisters in there, and I can hear them in my head and I can speak them, but when it comes to actually doing an audio version, uh, I kind of I struggled on some sort of things, uh, and you definitely don't want to be drinking when, when you're doing that as well, <laughs> because I tried doing that in a live poetry session, and I got really kind of sort of tongue tied and messed up. And they were just like, what is he doing to himself? <laughs> they were like, this is beautiful poetry, but you know, he's not made it easy on himself. And I'd just be like, <laughs> they just thought, does he hate himself or something that much? Why would he do something like this? Um, you know, he's supposed to be an inspirational person, but um, you know, so I kind of, um, but what I'd like to do is go back to the Poe one and, and the Shakespeare one and do those. I think I could do those in a dramatic kind of sort of voice. But then they're not in the tone of either Shakespeare uh, dramatism or and they're not in the tone, they're not horror poems when it comes to the Poe poems. So I've had this kind of sort of difficult thing where I've tried to market the Poe poetry and the Shakespeare stuff to people that like those things. But they go in there thinking, am I going to be reading some more Shakespeare or, or more uh, Edgar Allan Poe? And it's like, well, no, not really, because there's inspirational poetry in there and romantic poetry and that sort of stuff. But it doesn't, you know, and you can see shades or hints of the original person. You can see shades of Shakespeare and Poe but they're not identical, you know, and I think so. So that's the kind of thing I've struggled with in terms, I think, of generally sort of marketing those those things. I'm going to write more Shakespeare. I've only written uh, the first 50 sonnets. Um, so there's still the other uh, 150, um, it's 154 in total. So I've still got another 104 to, uh, to do, but um, they don't tend to take very long <laughs> because they're all very sort of short and you can quickly kind of uh, knock through them all. Um, but but I love him. I mean, that's why I picked Shakespeare yeah. because I didn't I didn't like Shakespeare to begin with years ago. And, um, you know, I kind of uh, fell, fell in love with this sort of stuff. I think I didn't like him because I didn't understand a lot of what he was saying. And it was the English teacher's interpretation of what he was saying that kind of sort of made me frustrated. And when I started taking it on my own terms, I started enjoying it a lot more. So I see uh, JD. Yeah, JD's that makes got total a question sense. Yeah, yeah. He has, he has a few questions. He has uh, one more after this. And we also have one from Margaret. So I do want to make sure we fit them in. Um, JD is, says, uh, hardest rhyme scheme poem you've ever written and why? That's a tricky one. I wouldn't know that off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. I, the problem is, is that my mind is kind of sort of like, I, I, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast this morning. <laughs> I always say that to people. And then you say, <laughs> well, how am I going to remember all of the kind of sort of things? Um, I will tell you actually. Yeah, I think I can. I think I can tell him. Um, so I did uh, one particular poem and it's not so much the rhyme scheme, but then that was involved in it, but it was also the structure. Um, so I'm very good at rhyming, I think, and this is why I thought I would be, end up being a, a cool musician, uh, but I can't play any instruments, so I just tend to write sort of lyrics. Um, but I wrote a poem uh, called uh, Passion, and I wrote it so that the uh, left-hand side of the word spelled out passion, the title spelled out passion, but it was uh, whatever the, I called the poem, uh, so it had a P and an A and so and so, and so. then it had passion on the right, and then just to make it just a little bit harder, it had passion down the middle. <laughs> and when you when I explained it to people, they just go, oh, that sounds quite cute. You know, that sounds quite interesting. And then you show it to people and they just go, how did you do that? <laughs> it's like I've shown them, you know, something that they're never, ever going to be able to work out how to do. And to be honest, it's kind of just like it's it's annoying because when you put it into a, a, a book or a, a, you know, a book of poetry, depending on how, how it's the, the formatting sort of comes across, it's nice to be able to sort of see it on a blog post or a kind of, sort of thing where you can inflate the screen because that's when everything lines up. And I got the idea because my first poem in my first uh, debut book uh, was, um, I called it Acrostolyptica, which was, um, and it wasn't actually acrostic, it was an abacadarian, which is a alphabetical poem, A through Z. But to make it more difficult, I did it A through Z on the left-hand side and then the right-hand side as well. So in order to make it work, I had to uh, use the word like barbecue, but I had to put BBQ 
because you know there's nothing that ends with the letter Q. So you had to be sort of creative in that sort of respect. But I then built, started building things based around that. And I, and I wrote some other ones that were like uh, using lots of uh, particular similar sounding words. There was a lot of alliterative sort of words. So I'd have a literature abstract across the elliptica. But this is what I'm talking about. Imagine try, trying to read that out <laughs> on an audio book. I'd have to just take a deep breath and, <laughs> and try and get my tongue untwisted. And then I'd probably twist it up again every time I tried to do it. But so, that, so uh, to answer JD's question, I think it's, um, you know, I've had kind of sort of I, find, I like rhyme structures in terms of they give me uh, direction. Uh, I like having something in place like a structure in place because it actually makes things easier for me. I just have to kind of sort of um, you know put something around it and then just go okay. And, and I often bring up silly things like I said okay about grass, you know, all the weather outside. Let's let's do, let's do that and let's put something around that and I can build that around that framework. But I think the absolute toughest ones are the ones where you try to do uh, the wordplay. Um, but I don't think I've ever found anything more difficult than that one that I did where I'd put it in the title and the left, right, and middle uh, side as well. Um, and I think it's it's in one of my books. Um, I can't remember which one. I don't know if it's in a, if it's actually in Soul Music. It might be <laughs> uh, the one that you've got, Christy. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, just um, you know, what, there, there's so many different kind of sort of forms and things that you can take from, and I find that very, very inspirational as well. You're not going to like everything. I think I like some of the mathematical forms. That's why I've always liked writing haiku, is that if I'm given a series of numbers... I can usually write to uh, the number of words or syllables or even the number of letters in, in sort of something. I think that even though I'm not a kind of mathematical person, I, my brain mathematically kind of sort of merges with the, the English language and it kind of uh, it becomes a puzzle. Someone someone said before it was like solving a puzzle. And, um, and that's what I feel like with found poetry sometimes when I'm going through it and trying to make a sentence fit and knowing that I've only got uh, certain words that I can use uh, towards the end as well. Sometimes I'll do big jumps in there or I'll do big cuts or something. And it can be difficult because I just I can't figure out how to end this. But I'll walk away from it if I get too frustrated and I'll come back and I'll always find a solution. And I've learned that about the un, un, um, the um, subconscious brain. I've read, I've read a book uh, about it uh, years ago. And it's just saying if you've got any kind of sort of problem, you know, start the problem off in your mind. But even if you can't solve it, just start working on it. And then if you can't get somewhere, walk away, go and go for a walk, go and do something, play a video game, uh, watch a TV program, or have a shower or, or just, just do anything. And I guarantee that your subconscious mind is going to be ticking away at that problem. And all of a sudden you're going to go, oh, Eureka moment, I'm going to then come back and, and fix it that way. And it's always worked that way for me. If I can't think of a, if I've been looking for two hours to try and pair a picture with with a poem for, because a lot of the time I won't write ecrastically and write something from a picture. Sometimes I, I will, uh, but most of the time I'll kind of pair a picture afterwards. I'll try and look for elements in, in the poem or something and say, uh, what, what would match really, really well? Oh, I've been looking for two hours. I can't find anything. Walk away, come back and then just think, oh, yeah, okay, that would that would actually work. And that's worked for me so, so many times. That's why I never really get writers... Uh, block or artist block because if I do then I'll just uh, find a creative way to let off some steam and then come back to it yeah and it just amazes me like the number I want to get in JD's question and then Margaret's but um, it, it amazes me like the number of types of poetry you do and there's I mean I was an English literature major and I don't even know some of the things that you know you're mentioning because you just study kind of like the the basics, the classics, all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's so much more out there to try that, um, you know, so many people who might be, you know, not very experienced with poetry and think they're not good at it. Maybe if they tried a different form, they would be good at it. Yeah, I think you've got to really kind of um, keep your mind open. And as, as, as I appreciate that I'm not into, um, funnily enough, even though I like Shakespeare, um, sometimes they talk about like, a, I'm not into iambic uh, pentameter and trying to work out uh, um, meter and that kind of stuff and stress and unstressed syllables. I, I did a stress and unstressed syllable, uh, a sing, sing, sing quet or something like that. Um, sing, sing quain, that was it, a sing quain. And uh, or it could be song quain, I don't know how to pronounce it uh, properly. But um, I tried stress and unstressed syllables and that always brings me out in the rush, just thinking, oh, it's just too <laughs> difficult. And every time I see something like that, I just think I'm not going to fight it. If I don't want to do it, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll become more and more kind of, like, if I get bored, I just think, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try it now. I'm in the right frame of mind. I'm bored. I've done everything else uh, and everything else is boring me now. <laughs> maybe I'll try the difficult thing that I didn't want to do because it's a challenge. Um, but, but stuff like that, you know, so what, what I mean is I'll come along and I'll look at a whole kind of list of forms and I'll, then I'll start saying, well, that one's got an ABCC rhyme structure. Well, I like that because they, they present it in that way. So therefore, I'll, and then I'll list that down on a piece of paper. I'll put it down the side and sometimes I'll have the kind of sort of guide marks there to sort of tell me and say, right, OK, I need to do this and, and do it in such a way. 
and that's how I can construct it. And then sometimes I forget to, I've left the guide marks there. So when I go to publish it, I'll have to delete those out again. And, um, but yeah, you know, it's just, it's just, I think that, you know, you should look through the entire series of forms and don't be afraid, just try the ones, because if you find one that you like, there's going to be about another 15, 20 on there that are going to have a similar kind of sort of structure. And you'll like those ones as well. And I found that, you know, I, uh, one, of my, one of my poetry books, it might be the, also the soul music book, a book as well. Uh, I've got just tons of forms that I tried because they were all variants on the form. They might have kind of repetition. I like re like trying to use repetition. I mean, uh, I think uh, it might be the Villanelle or something like that, where you actually have to take six words and then use them in six different ways. And I just thought, oh, my God, how difficult is that? Because not, not a lot of words uh, have six different interpretations that you can get from them. They're usually it's only like there's two or three ways that you can read them. So you kind of like find yourself building some kind of uh, intricate kind of sort of thing. And some people don't like that. Some people just think oh, it's too frustrating. But I've done it a couple of times now. And, um, and I found that once I've done it once, even if it was painful to, to do to begin with, I'm kind of just like I'm, I'm relishing the challenge of, of doing it again. And and this is the funny sort of thing is that I found is that if you kind of open up the door to certain sort of things, they give you the foundation or pave the way for something else. And this is why I've managed to get to where I am now and why I've managed to publish so many things, why I've managed to do so many things. It's because I've learned how to do one thing. And I just thought, well, if I, if I can do that, it means I can do that and I can figure out how to put all the bits and pieces together and just keep building and, and building from that point. Those are great points. And I think the the question from JD on the screen has pretty much been answered by your cake book, The Fifty Shades of Cake. <laughs> but he says, uh, has something ever you've written ever made you laugh? And I, I think I think that's a yes. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm um, heavily influenced by a lot of music uh, as well, you know, music lyrics and things and people, especially I do like a band called Electric Six. And he basically, uh, the, the guy, uh, Dick Valentine, I think his name, real name is Tyler Spencer. He says that uh, 90, something like 90 percent or 95 percent of their songs are about uh, are, um, uh, about nothing at all. And I think he's lying because a lot of the things that he writes is very, very funny. Um, but, um, you know, th th they seem insightful in, in some sort of ways. And uh, you just think you can't be saying that a lot of this sort of stuff is. But he'll say nonsense things like every, every policeman needs a chief. And, and and things like that. And um, what what uh, would, what JD was saying was that um, you know I tend to laugh at my own sort of comedy. If I laugh at my own comedy, people think, well, you laugh at your own jokes. But I find that as a kind of I can read things as a reader as well as a writer. So I can kind of switch the writer brain off and just go, okay, I'm going to read this as a reader. Oh, that makes me laugh. And my comedy bits, if it doesn't make me laugh, I just think, okay, well, I'll I'll work on it until it makes me laugh. And to give an example, I wrote um, a a poem using uh, heavily influenced by Secret uh, by um. Uh, electric six uh was called um hot little biscuit and uh because of the whole kind of cakes and the other kind of sort of stuff as well but that kind of thing made, made me laugh and i was laughing about all of the, the and the reason that it made me laugh so much when i think about it was because i was writing it in this kind of sort of style in, in um dick valentine stroke tyler spencer style um but it was it was all my own as well so i'd be writing these kind of ridiculous lines in there and I, I just, it just made me laugh. I can imagine these, I can imagine, I've got a very good imagination, so I can imagine people singing uh, this kind of sort of thing, but it wasn't a kind of sort of song. It was just a very, very long kind of storied sort of poem. It was a romantic, silly kind of sort of poem uh, that I did. Um, but, but, you know, often I will make myself laugh. Is that, yes, you know, I mean, the 50 uh, um, Shapes of Cakes thing, yes, if I didn't laugh at the tweet, then I, then I wouldn't have included it. I think there were some that I didn't actually include in the book. Um, but there, there's a lot of humour in some of my, even though um, some of my, my debut had as a, it had inspirational, um, romantic as well, and, and philosophical. Now the philosophical ones are just me basically saying that's my comedy ones. Um, but then it, as it, as time went on, I found myself writing more inspirational, romantic poems. And then what I've, I've now found is that I'm then combining the comedy elements into some of those. So you'll be right, reading a lot of serious ones. But then I remember something that the singer Mike Patton said from Faith No More. He said that um, he writes some humorous things, but he writes a lot of serious things. And he tends to say, when you do humor, you're taking the left turn immediately. And, you know, so people might not want to listen to They might not want to hear a joke 20, 30 times. It might be funny the first time. Whereas I find something serious, people can keep going back to again and again and again. And that's why I've kind of sort of I give myself advice a lot in a lot of my poetry. And, you know, you say about you say writing for yourself. So I give myself um, an advice on certain issues and, and it could be on self-confidence or just uh, just life in general. And then, then then if anybody else relates to it as well, then I'm, I'm happy. And I just think, well, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to write something that's kind of positive and uh, inspirational for myself. But it seems that it also because it's emotionally kind of sort of connected to me and to everybody else as well. People. Um, 
really kind of uh, really kind of sort of connect uh, to to my poetry because of the emotional uh, bond that I sort of create with them when I when I do it. And even even if it only gets through to sort of one person, you know, I said I'm happy. I'd like to have a huge audience, but when I get the odd person come to me saying, "Oh, that particular one really." move me and it's and it's accumulation as well because sometimes i feel like is anybody reading me out there and then i'll get tons and tons of people say well yes we think you're great and i'm just like wow you know and i'm kind of so i'm so humbled you know i'm so, so happy by it going right off of that in our last couple of minutes um margaret had asked uh, which do you sell more of the nonfiction workbook side or the poetry side or is it the more recent releases that do best as per the rule uh, I would say, um, I don't know if it's even hilariously, I don't sell a lot of my poetry books. Um, it's definitely the workbooks and the other sort of stuff that we're doing well with. I mean, my, my, that's why my kind of sort of uh, publishing focus, I've got eight books individually myself now, um, but I have 22 other publications with Auroras and Blossoms because um, we, we like doing that and we like uh, providing that. And I feel like uh, it's unfortunate for me that uh, poetry is kind of just sort of like I'll have a real kind of sort of core of 10, 15 people that are really into what I'm doing, but I won't win tons and tons of you kind of sort of people. I find it very difficult to market myself. I, I tried a couple of tricks, like, for example, um, I'll give you one of the examples of the tricks. Soul Music, The Colour of, of Magic uh, is a combination of two Terry Pratchett titles. So I was hoping to steal Terry Pratchett's thunder <laughs> in relation to that. I'm the world's one of the world's biggest uh, Terry Pratchett fans. I love it. I love the video games. I love the books. Um, I really do love the whole um, world of Discworld. I just think it's wonderful. And I love Neil Gaiman as well. I love all of his, absolutely love all of his stuff as well. And I'm still trying to catch up with all of his stuff. But, um, you know, I actually met Neil Gaiman uh, as well. And he, and he actually um, told me to to make good art. I put a little note, a note on uh, on a book that I sent up to him. And everybody else, he was just signing stuff and pushing them on. And then he read my note and I said, and he went and said, what do you do, David? And I said, I'm a writer. And he says, well, please continue making <laughs> and it's like i know he says that all the time but it was just lovely to actually have him stop what he was doing and i just thought i've made i've had an impact on someone i think it made my um my co-writer and not my co it wasn't sandrine i was with uh, another writer in, in england at the time and uh, i think it made him uh, a bit jealous the fact that he was a big neil gaming fan and he didn't get the same kind of um <laughs> same kind of interaction uh with him but uh, yeah you know so so um and that's why i did like poe for example i call that um I, i've included a lot of the poe uh, poetry names in there and the reason I'm bringing that up is that I'm trying lots of marketing tricks with my poetry um, but it, as it just so trans transpires we're going to have more people that want how-to guides and we're going to have more people that are going to want uh, visual things and other artistic things um, and um, yeah so I've sold some poetry books I've given a lot of my poetry books away uh, with my with my debut and that didn't get me anywhere I, it cost me uh, I'd say hundreds of pounds to do that so i would never uh, as a strategy i, I thought it, people would feel more obligated to do something with an actual print copy print, print copy and i would say that that's i was very very wrong so don't ever go spending the money like that again because i'm never going to recoup the investment on that i'd have to sell probably two thousand copies of my um uh, my debut uh, poetry book and i'm never going to sell that many copies i don't think uh, i'd like to think i will do i want to be really really big you know like some of these uh, people on button poetry and other sort of places that are doing really really well and i think with the right kind of marketing the problem is is that poetry uh, on its own is that if i could become big if i wrote a novel if i wrote a fantasy novel then uh, maybe i could get really big off of that and then say now look at my poetry and then i then get the cross promotion with that but i haven't got around to doing that i started writing a detective story with with another author it wasn't sandrine <laughs> um and um we got as far as about six chapters um, but then I've never really kind of done anything more with, with that. And uh, I kind of think one day I'm going to, but at the moment I'm just too caught up with Auroras and Blossoms and, and writing all the poetry as well. Um, but everybody wants how-to books. Everybody wants the, uh, we've got lots of things like on social media books as well on how to promote yourself better on social media. And those ones have got more sales than uh, much more sales than, than my own poetry books. Well, I think it's funny how you say if you wrote fantasy, then maybe you could uh, piggyback the poetry on it. I'm, you know, I'm the fantasy author. I'm kind of thinking the other way that, Maybe if I wrote poetry, maybe I could piggyback my fantasy on it. Maybe some people would read it as well. So <laughs> it all depends on what side of the book you're sitting. But uh, anyway, uh, we just want one more comment here we got from uh, Tina McFarland's joined us. And she was saying, I think that you eventually find a style of writing poetry that works for you. But it's great to step outside your comfort zone. So thanks for joining us, Tina. I'm just conscious of the time. Uh, David, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, that's been great having you on here. And I think uh, we had, a, that's probably our busiest comment section in there we've had so far. People have Excellent. really enjoyed, I, I think the 50 shades of cake uh, really set it off. But uh, 
Yeah. 50 shapes of cake this is the thing yeah, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> because because i think about the different shapes of cakes and you yeah, just right. think, oh like that could be rude as well so. yeah. i'm gonna have to pick that up and read it and see what it's about so, anyway. i think you'll love it i think you'll find it very funny oh, i'm sure i will i love the british comedy my ancestors are from england so yeah, i really enjoy it so i just want to ask christy before we go christy do you have anything that you want to announce that's uh, new in the christy straddles world yeah, the only thing that I want to announce is that my Patreon is actually only $4 away from its first goal. And at Ooh. that point, I'm going to be writing um, one short story a month guaranteed. So now I write flash fiction and short stories here and there, but I do other updates on there as well. And it's not always writing, you know, a short story a month or anything like that. But once we reach that first goal, I will be doing that. And it's all different genres. It could be fantasy. It could be historical fiction. It could be something totally different, crime fiction, anything. Um, but yeah, only $4 um, out. So I've had three people join in the past um, like three or four days, which is wow. really fantastic. I'm super excited about that. So if anyone wants to join at just a dollar a month, you get access to almost every single benefit there is. It's really just um, a place where we can have a community and all, you know, chat and I can share with you some exclusive fiction. So feel free to head on over there. It's just patreon.com slash Christy Stratus. So that's my news this week. How about you, Richard? I think that's awesome. I think we all need to put the pressure on Christy Stratos and uh, join that Patreon so we can make her write a story a month. <laughs> we'll, we'll hold you to it. So, uh, My news is uh, Keeper of the Jewels, of the Jewels uh, releasing next uh, Tuesday. So I'm just doing the very finishing polishing edit on it this week. I'm cramming myself all day and all night uh, trying to just polish it a bit more. Amazon's giving me the ticker. It's going off at uh, the end of Friday is my last day to actually upload the very final uh, manuscript to Amazon. So anyway, it'll be live on Tuesday. Keeper of the Jewel is book one, the High Cliff Guardians uh, series. And so next week, uh, our guest is fantasy author Carrie Brown. And Carrie is the author of the Arrigo series. She's born in Tennessee, raised in Chicago. Carrie loves mythology, dark fairy tales, and anything medieval. And she's also decided to put them all together. Oh, so she's decided to put them all together and write in. Carrie's actually releasing book two this week. So it'll be interesting to speak to her and see how her launch went. And uh, sorry, Dave, before we go, I, I should have asked you, where can people find your books? Uh, I'm on Amazon. Um, there is another David Ellis that uh, is a lawyer, uh, so you don't want to go looking for him. Uh, he writes with David Patterson as well, actually. So I once pretended to to be him, and people said, "Don't do that. That's uh, that's very very bad." And I just said, "No, it's just fun. It's just a bit of fun." <laughs> and this is why I'll never change my writing name as well, you know, because of this other David Ellis lawyer. Um, so what I suggest is that maybe you look up the very specific things, like the Fifty Shapes of Cakes or um, the Edgar Allan Poe book, It's Sea a Dream Within, or stuff like that. When you look me up on Amazon, you'll then get my Amazon actual Amazon uh, profile. Um, and you know, so all of my books are on Amazon. Uh, I also use Draft to Digital, so a lot of them are available uh, on other kind of platforms as well. Uh, if you are struggling to find me on either Amazon or uh, elsewhere, and you get me mixed up with the other David Ellis, there's my website, which is uh, Too Full to Write, and that's there's no number twos. It's T W O F U L L T O W R I T E dot com. And uh, if you go there, then uh, there will be a uh, menu screen where you can select my books. And that'll have all of my own individual books there. What you won't have also is Auroras and Blossoms. And Auroras and Blossoms, uh, the website is abpositiveart.com. And if you go to abpositiveart.com, there'll be uh, something in the menu that says read. And if you click on read, you'll get all of the lovely books that we've got there as well. So the other 22 publications I'm involved with. Well, that's awesome. I think Christy's put uh, the website up there too, as well, the Amazon site up there as well. So Thank we uh, we look forward to speaking to you and your partner uh, in crime uh, coming up. I I imagine it's a few weeks from now. So uh, we yeah, look I guess so. yeah. And uh, I'm just conscious of your time. It's probably about two o'clock now in, in Kent. So uh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for staying up so late and being with us. We really appreciate it. I love so, every minute of it. Thank you. That's awesome. So until next week, uh, we Christy and I hope that everyone stays safe and we want you all to take care. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much.